Hey, and welcome back to the Big Band Scene Revisited. If you thought part three was good with the bo- interview with Bob Crosby live at Disneyland, wait till you hear part four. Here on the Big Band Scene Revisited. On everything. That's correct. <laughs> well, we're backstage again. Backstage again here with uh, Disneyland. Carnation Ballroom, Confusion Ballroom with uh, the man of Club 15, Mr. Bob Crosby. Bob, you did something tonight I waited all night to hear. What was that? Bob Crosby sing. What else? Oh, well, I don't sing much anymore. I, Why? Why? Because the music's too good, and I don't sing that well, quite frankly. And, of course, playing here at the Carnation Plaza in this wonderful atmosphere of Disneyland, People come out here to dance, and dancing is, I think, the most beautiful form of courtship. Yeah, well, you can still dance to singing. Yeah, but the kind of songs I sing, like Basin Street Blues or Up a Lazy River or something, they're not particularly romantic. I like to, uh, if I could really sing, I'd like to sing the love ballads. And, uh, yeah, you did one in the 40s that said, really, I really enjoyed it, one called Do You Care? Oh, yeah. You remember that one? Yeah, well, we wrote it and did everything else that was all gone thing. Did that and another one called And You Forgot About Me. Oh, yeah, movie. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Do you do big noise from a necker anymore? I do, and my bass player, Jack Lesberg, his uh, wife's father died, and he couldn't make this gig, so we've been using Red Calendar on bass. And if you know much about Big Noise Monetka, you got to do that silly whistle. It's a bass and drum duet. And uh, Red had never played Big Noise Monetka, and he didn't feel like he wanted to play it. So I've never asked him to do it. But uh, we're Lesberg here, or, you know, we'd do it. But yeah. I'd rather not do it than do it poorly. Yeah, that was one of those tunes that was kind of an impromptu uh, thing, wasn't it? I'll say it was impromptu. <laughs> those were the days when you made records, you either made two or four. Because you used the wax, you used the stone instead of electricity when you recorded. <laughs> Nobody could trust the way the electricity would come off and on as far as rotating the mother record. I know this is a little, sounds like MIT. <laughs> But they used to use a stone, so that as the stone came down, the mother record would turn around, you'd play, and the mother would record what you were doing, but it had to be constant. And if you were on AC or DC current, everyone knows that it varies. And we had done three numbers, and the fourth arrangement came in that was no good. So I turned to Bobby Haggard and Ray Baduke, and I said, why don't we do that thing we do down at the Blackhawk restaurant called Big Noise from Winnetka? Dedicated to a lot of wonderful kids from Winnetka who used to come in to hear the band. So we did. Silly whistle, bass, drum, nothing else. And Freddie, I'd say that thing has probably sold over uh, 20 million records. It's been played in rock. It's been recorded in Japanese. It's been recorded in French. Hank Mancini did it. And the rock drummer that did it, I think, was a boy named Nelson. I'm not familiar with rock music. <coughs> But everybody's taking a crack at Big Noise from that. Yeah, I know while I was in England a couple of years ago, uh, Sid Lawrence, who plays the Miller music in England, uh, yeah. he featured it as one of his highlight numbers, isn't Big that, Noise from Winnetka. Isn't that nice? I'm glad Glenn Miller wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Not hardly. He didn't. <laughs> I know. And I, was, I don't recall him ever playing it, but the Miller style band in England is doing it. In fact, yeah. it's one of the highlights of the show. The drummer gets down and, uh, without that, missing a beat, and walks around and bangs on everything. That's correct. Well, who knows? We got a lot of ghost images running around now. Yeah, I know. And more power to them. God love them. What do you uh, think? There'll be a Bob Crosby ghost band? I think when I go, I think they better <laughs> let it all lay. <laughs> I uh, somehow or another, I wouldn't like. Uh, I have a son that sings and has a good band, but he's more in country rock. Yeah, Chris. Chris, yeah. yeah. But you know, Bob, uh, going back to the 40s, you had the, probably the world's number one big band fan. What was her name? Mrs. Celeste uh, Labrosa? Celeste Labrosa. She was the daughter of Dr. Murphy, and anyone who knows medicine knows that he was the first one to uh, do surgery. He was a great surgeon. And uh, he developed a way for taking out appendix called the Murphy Button. Hmm. Uh, this is a little 
too deep probably for a lot of your listeners, but she was his daughter, and she took a looking to a li- looking and a liking <laughs> to our band, and she really was very instrumental in our success. She was one of the first groupies of all time. She's still living, or she's long gone? Oh, she's gone. She was a biggie, though. As a matter of fact, I heard the story that uh, since a local in New York was 802, her address was 802. So you <laughs> said that, that was a standing joke. Go to the local. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall that. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm learning. I'm telling you a few things, Bob. That probably you don't even know yourself. No. I've forgotten a lot of things, Fred, and I don't know how you are, and, and I don't know how your listeners feel, but I've had a wonderful career, a wonderful life, I've met the greatest people in the world, musicians, and I never want to look backwards, by that I don't mean I want to change my music or anything or what I play, but I live for tomorrow, and I think all of us should. What's the saying, tomorrow is the first day of your life? Right. Yeah. But you had a great one in Yank Lawson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, was it true, Bob, that when Yank was in the band, it was sky high? And when Yank was away, it seemed like it went down some. Did you find that true? A lot of critics pointed that out. Well, I wouldn't make that kind of a judgment. I really wouldn't. I think Yank is an individual, and I think Yank's a great player. Uh, what did happen was Billy Butterfield came in the band, and of course, Billy was a... Uh, Tremendous trumpet player. We had a great trumpet section, and I can't, I can't, I couldn't make that kind of judgment. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that kind of judgment. We had great clarinet players. Who's going to tell me who was better, Fazola, Irving Fazola, or Matty Matlock, or Eddie Miller played some of the greatest clarinet in the world? They were all great in their own way. Hank D'Amico, yeah. that I had, Gus Pavona. We played 16 bars of great clarinet and then laughed to the bridge and played, and now he's with Steve Allen, and it fits with him. Well, what happened, Bob, when you got out of the service from the Marine Corps, you organized the band again, but nothing happened. You think you was too long out of the scene? Yes, yeah, something did happen. Something great happened. Don't forget, I got out of the service. I'd spent three years overseas with the Marine Corps. I came back and, as you know, recordings and radio were much more important than television has ever been as far as building stars and images and singers and vocalists and bands. I got out of the Marine Corps. I needed some money. I had five children. I was broke. So I went to Decca Records and I said, gee, I want to make some recordings. I need some exposure. And I was told by the president of Decca, uh, that they had hired some other people while I was overseas winning the last war we won. <laughs> and they didn't have room on the label for me. Then I called up the guys who had been with me for many years, and I couldn't blame them at all. When I went to the Marine Corps, they went like Eddie Miller went with Alfred Newman out of 20th Century Fox. Butterfield became first Trump player at CBS. Yank and Haggard became big stars on the NBC Tonight Show with uh, Skitch Henderson. And I couldn't ask these guys to give up that kind of loot. So I organized a different style band. And I got a boy named Tommy Todd to write some arrangements. And I used Dave Pell on uh, tenor sax. I had Mary McEachern. I had uh, Jack Mintz. I had Gus Pavona, who I still think is a great clarinet player. And uh, Teddy Nash I had in the band, Willie Schwartz I had in the band, pretty good players. Jack Sperling was in the band, Marty Corb, and we hit the road. And we made money, and we pleased people, but we didn't play any Dixieland. I carried William Manone with me on one tour, and I said, don't ever play until I would play Dixie. And when we play Dixie, I'll point to you, and then you play. And he would get up, and we'd have the Dixie sound. But it still was Sub Rosa. Dixie. But I was very proud of that band. We made some records and they were doggone good records. Yeah, for Decca. Yeah. Not for Decca. Oh, no. was it Coral or... Uh, no, it came yeah. out on a bootleg label. Oh, on a bootleg label, huh? It just came out. And uh, you, I don't know where you could find it. I, if I could find the guy who put them out, I'd arrest him. But <laughs> <clears throat> he did take a lot of tapes and things we did. But you must understand the economics. The guy gets out of the service in 1945, or the latter part of 45, 46, like I did, and you can't get a job, and the guys that you've worked with and 
the library that you play is so specialized that I just couldn't go out and hire 14 guys and play these kind of arrangements. I can't do that. I got to have hand-picked musicians. And I still needed the loot. I had to take care of my wife and my children. So I had a different type band. Now later on I switched back. When I got lucky and got Club 15, I got the old guys back again. But for one period of time, I think I think we were only together about a year, year and a half. But you listen, if you ever get that record, yeah, I'm look for it. Look for it. It's quite unusual. And Tommy Todd wrote some beautiful arrangements for that band. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have a look for that. Maybe we can feature it on the show. Well, Bob, with Dixieland, you think he'll ever make a big comeback, uh, as big as he was back in the 40s? Well, on the one set you had, you had everybody out dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Dixieland, you say comeback. Well, actually, it never went away, but I don't think it's big as it used to be, though. It is everywhere but in the United States of America. Yeah, and you know, that's strange that more people in Europe appreciate more of what we do here than we do ourselves. That's a kind of a strange paradox. You know why? Because it's the only art form America's ever had. This is American jazz. And nobody else can play it like American musicians. I remember one story, Freddie. Somebody called up somebody in the band. I think it was Johnny Best they called on the telephone. They wanted to know about a certain trumpet player. And the guy that called him was Benny Goodman. And he finally got down to nitty gritty. He said, well, I know you're all going to the service. Is there one guy in the band that can really play the real true Dixieland jazz? Because I want to play some, some Dixieland music. And John Best said, well, Benny, I don't know if he can play it or not. He was born 10 miles north of New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> about right, Bob. But what about the future? Have you got any future plans that we can look for? Or? Tomorrow will be the first day of my life. But you're going to still keep that band going. I'm going to try. I, I love it. I love the people. I love the things they say. I had a guy come up to me last night, and they get mixed up. They're so wonderful, people are. People, well, let me say folk are wonderful. This guy came up. He says, you know, you were one. I was one. No, wait a minute. What did he say now? He said, you know, you were one of my greatest fans. This is a guy listening to the band. He got mixed up. He wanted to say, I was one of your greatest fans. But he said to me, Bob Crosby, he said, you were one of my greatest fans. See what your music does to him, Bob? <laughs> they, they get wacky. Yeah. Well, how do you, how do you view the uh, big band scene today, uh, Bob? What's happening? What little it, there is happening? Well, Freddie, I view it this way. If we go back to playing dance music, if we go back to the idea that we were dance bands and should play for dancing and that ballroom dancing is a form of courtship and that's where a guy meets a girl beautiful music well, i hope you enjoyed part four of bob crosby's interview with my dad fred woodruff live at disneyland so for the big band scene revisited fred woodruff productions at sierra pine studios i'm gerald woodruff